So um, the density of most comets is between half of the density of water and 1.2 times the density of water. Which of these is it closest to in composition based on that density? All right, yeah, so that density would be more similar to the Jovian planets, which might make you wonder, okay, that does that mean that comets are made of gas? No, it does not, because as we mentioned before, having a low density doesn't necessarily mean that your composition is something specific. It could just mean that they're fluffy, that they contain a lot of empty space. And so that is essentially what comets are. They are a fluffy um, um, kind of collection of icy particles, mostly, with some dust and rock. They're primarily ice, but they do have some dust, and so that leads many astronomers to describe them as dirty snowballs. Um, as the comet approaches the sun, the process of sublimation causes gas and dust to go from their solid form to gas. So um, the ice sublimates into water vapor, and that um, causes the, this coma to form around the comet's nucleus. And that coma can be the size of Jupiter, even the nucleus is usually rather small. And comet tails are made from material from this coma being pushed away um, as the, from both by the solar wind and as it's left behind as the comet continues in its orbit. So here's a picture of what I mean by that. Um, the nucleus of this comet would be some, a very tiny pin, pinpoint at the center of this image. Um, this is called the dust tail, and then this tail is called the ion tail. And see, based on your reading, can you tell which direction is this comet moving? All right, good guesses so far. Both three and four seem reasonable. Um, it turns out that four is the direction. It move, it's leaving behind the debris and dust tail as it moves to the left. Um, so if we take a closer picture of this um, in sort of a diagram format, these two tails, the dust tail gets left behind the comet, but it can actually get in front of the comet in its orbit at, in a, on occasion. So the dust tail is not the most helpful for helping us figure out which direction the comet is moving. But the ion tail is really helpful because the ion tail always points away from the sun. So coming back to our example, what direction must the sun be in this image? All right. Yeah, so the ion tail points directly away from the sun, meaning that the sun must be in the direction of arrow number three here. So let me come back to that diagram real quick. This ion tail points directly away from the sun. And you can always distinguish the ion tail from the dust tail because the ion tail is really thin. So essentially this is made of, um, it's being swept along. And so it's moving quickly away from the comet. Um, it's swept away by the solar wind. And then the dust tail is the parts that are being ejected from the comet as it vaporizes. And as the comet orbits, now these chunks are still somewhat gravitationally bound to the comet, but they basically move into the uh, sun's orbit. So you can think of these as a little um, trail of particles that is now in the comet's um, and sun's orbit. Okay, so we did this. So the solar wind sweeps the ion tail away very sharply, whereas the dust tail is usually much more diffuse. And as the, as the comet orbits the sun, then the ion tail will always point directly away from the sun. So based on looking at the ion tail, you can tell where the sun is. And then since the comet is generally close to the sun during its orbit, then if the ion tail is pointing directly away, sorry, oops, meant to annotate. Let me get my colors here. If the ion tail is pointing away from the sun, then you can always tell where the comet will be orbiting because it should be almost perpendicular to that ion tail. 
at all times. Okay, um, let me see. I think that this will animate. Yeah. So here's an example that ion tail always points directly away from the sun that is shaded in blue. And then the gray is the dust tail. So as you can see, it's always, the dust tail is always trailing the comet as it orbits. Um, but sometimes it, um, on this kind of far side after it's swung around the sun, it gets in front of the comet in its orbital path. So comets orbit in very large and high eccentricity orbits. Um, so here's a couple of examples. The solar system orbits of the planets are shown here in um, the black lines. Pluto's is this tilted black line. And then Comet Temple 1 is this pink orbit. Comet Halley, which you've probably heard before, is this blue orbit. And then Comet Hayukutake is this green one. So all comets share the feature that they come very close to the sun for a very short period of time, but they spend most of their time in locations far from the sun. Um, when we look at all of their eccentricities and semi-major axes and inclinations, um, these are all relatively large semi-major axes. Um, Temple one is like within the asteroid belt based on its semi-major axis. And you can see like Comet Halley and Comet Hayukitaki, they have extremely high eccentricities. And because of those very high eccentricities, most of the time is very far from the sun. Um, that um, location where their um, aphelions are, are called the Oort cloud. This is a hypothetical structure where comets um, are supposed to originate and where they spend most of their time. And how do we know that this Oort cloud is out there? Well, you can basically look at the orbital shapes and inclinations of the comets and notice that planets have relatively low inclinations and they're all within basically the same orbital plane. But then comets are in random inclinations. So that means that their high eccentricity orbits take them very far away and they take them all in different directions. So based on that, we deduce that the Oort cloud where comets spend most of their time is actually spherical rather than belt-shaped. So even though the asteroid belt is belt-shaped, the Oort cloud where comets come from is a spherical shell. 